counted it all as loss. He counted it um, literally as, um, as, as refuse com- compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ and being found in Him and knowing Him. And we understand that Jesus is worth more than anything this world has to offer. And because of Jesus, we have everything for eternity. So our worth is found in that and our worth is found in Christ alone. This morning, we're going to study another area of our minds that we need to reset that many of us probably struggle with this morning, and that is our past. We all have a past this morning. Things that we have done before we became a believer, some things we've done since we became a believer, if we're honest, we have a past. But the truth of Scripture is that we do not allow our past to define us. We're going to reset the thought in our mind that my past defines me. My past will not define me. We're going to continue to look at the life of Paul or Saul. Saul was Paul's Roman name. So the passage this morning refers to him as Saul. I call him Paul. You're going to probably hear me say both quite a lot. It's just a different, it's a Roman name and a Hebrew name, Paul and Saul. And so it it gets tricky. (laughs) But we're going to look at his life. We're going to look at his past. And we're going to see how there's nothing in our past that disqualifies us from the work that Jesus Christ wants to do in us and through us. Nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Acts chapter 7. We're going to be in Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 9 this morning. Starting with verse 54 of chapter 7. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What we see here is Stephen, a disciple of Christ, a preacher who had just given a very long speech. Most of chapter 7 up to verse 54 is Stephen's speech to the Sanhedrin, to the Jews, where he was... Um, and no uncertain terms calling them out for what they had done to Jesus Christ. You look, um, verse 51, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you have always resisted the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so did you. And then he went on to say, And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous nun, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. He was calling them out for what they did to Christ. He was bold. He was outspoken. And, and, and the Jews didn't like it. We see in verse 54 that they heard these things. They were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Enraged. Full of fury. Full of anger. Grinding their teeth at him. And what the, the scripture paints here is a picture of an angry mob that chases him out of the city. Chases him outside the center of the city. And there they stone him and they kill him. In rage, And we see this beautiful picture where Stephen looks up to, to the heavens and prays and he gets a vision of the Son of God standing at the right hand of God. So he knows that we know that even in our suffering and in our persecution, God is there to give us what we need. He saw Christ even at the point of death. And he said, forgive them, God, for this sin. Forgive them. And don't hold it against them. And he said that and he fell asleep. There's something I want us to see about what the angry mob did in this passage. In verse 58. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. What this tells us in this passage. They took the garments from Stephen. They stripped him. And laid them at the feet of Saul for Saul's approval. We see Saul standing over this as a member of the Sanhedrin, giving his full approval of it, that it pleased him even. Verse 
1 of chapter 8 and says, And Saul approved of his execution. Saul approved. That word literally means was pleased with his execution. He stood there, watched it, and was pleased with it. Was pleased with it. Can you imagine being pleased with someone being stoned to death, bludgeoned to death at the hand of angry mob, and the people desiring to please you so much, desiring to please you, come and brought their garments to you, and it brought pleasure to you. We continue to read in verse 1, it says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they, scattered, they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, devout men, buried Stephen, and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. I want us to see something here also. When persecution comes against the church, it comes for the sake of the growth of the church. When persecution comes against the church, it comes for the sake of the growth of the church. Because what it forced these believers to do was to scatter. And when they scattered, their influence scattered. They didn't shut down what they were doing, yet their influence was driven out into all the region. They continued to be the church in the face of persecution. But what we see here was that Paul continued to ravage the church. We see in verse 3 of chapter 8, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And what we see here, many times, you know, when there's war, when there's things going on, they'll come in and take all the men in a town, but they'll spare the women and children. There was such a hatred here of Christianity, such a hatred of the truth that they wanted it to be stopped so much. Not only were they killing the men and, and capturing the men and taking them into captivity, which was not a walk, of, walk in the park, y'all. They were not taking good care of them. They would have been beaten and stoned and hurt and, and persecuted. But he was doing it to the women too. They were doing everything in their power to stop the spread of Christianity. And I do say that this morning, there's probably some of that going on in our country today, too. We do know that we are one of the few churches in town meeting. And I don't say this as a knock against any other church. Because we're all doing what we can to do with, Ill with unprecedented circumstances. But there's a lot of things happening on Facebook this morning where churches are sending the word out to masses. And it's being shared. And many people are still being able to hear the word of God through different means. When persecution comes against the church, we still have an opportunity and an obligation to speak the word even greater in the times we are in now. We have to be true to our faith so that people can have hope in dark times. But what we also see is someone who hated Christianity so much he was doing everything in his power, including hurting women, killing women, capturing women, to stop the spread of it. To stop the spread of it. And we're going to continue to see this morning that God had a different plan for Saul. God saw something else in Saul than what Saul saw in himself. Let's read now. Let's turn on over to chapter 9. We see here, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way... Men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul, what we see here, was still breathing, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. He was full of rage that he was breathing it. And he was ready to go. He was ready to leave Jerusalem. He knew they had scattered and he was on a mission to go and get them and gather them and do away with them. Damascus was a six days journey by foot from Jerusalem. So it wasn't like he was just hopping in a car and going somewhere. He was putting a lot of effort into chasing these people down, into getting them. So if he could find anyone belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The way was what they were calling Christianity at that point. That was what they called Christians at the very beginning, was members of the way. And he was sought to get them. Now we see in verse 3, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And so Paul had set out to head to to Damascus to to murder Christians, to, to bind them, to carry them back to Jerusalem, to stop the spread of Christianity. And God suddenly gets a hold of him. He interrupts his plans with God's plans. Has that ever happened in your life where God interrupts what you had planned and what you wanted to do and all of a sudden you are doing something different? And what Paul was doing at this point was laying on the ground blinded. God got his attention in such a way that he humbled him to where all he could do at this point was cry out, Who are you, Lord? And we see that God said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? And we talked about him so much last week, and I want to expound on this a little bit more. Everything Paul had done in his life up to this point as a member of the Sanhedrin, as a Pharisee, as one who kept every bit of the law was to try and please God, to try and be right with God. And he had done everything that he thought in his power to work to have righteousness. And in his mind, this is what he was still doing. He still thought that by doing this, he was preserving the old customs, preserving the old law, preserving his way of life that had been threatened. And so he really thought that by doing this, he was working righteousness and pleasing God. And it took God blinding him and crying out to him saying, Saul, Saul, why are you doing this to me? The offense wasn't against those that he was killing, those that he was persecuting. The offense was with God himself. So for someone who had given their lives to try and attain righteousness, all of a sudden God says, why are you doing this to me? This was that moment where Paul lost everything that we talked about last week. This was the moment where it became a realization for Paul that everything that he is doing now was not righteousness, it was sinfulness, and he was persecuting the Lord. And he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. We must understand that Paul would have had a familiarity of who Jesus was. Scholars and people believe that Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin that convicted Jesus and sent him to be be killed. That he would have been in that group. He would have heard his teachings. There would have been a personal awareness here of who Jesus was. A personal awareness. And he says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And he continues to say to him, but rise and enter the city, verse 6, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. What we see here is that he was been gotten hold of in such a way that God had blinded him. Such a strong, proud man had been made weak and humble, blinded into such an emotional state that he could not eat or drink for three days. There's probably been times in your life where you have been in so much turmoil that you could not eat or drink. This is where Paul was. God had humbled him in such a way that he was helpless. He was helpless. He was helpless. And what we see, God continues to work because God saw something in Saul. Verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. What I want us to see here in this passage 
is that God saw a purpose for Saul in the midst of his sinfulness. God saw a purpose for Saul in the midst of his sinfulness. And God reached down and blinded him and humbled him and sent Ananias to him because he had a purpose for him that we see in verse 16. In verse 15, for, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. God had chosen him for a purpose to go and carry his name to the Gentiles. But as we already see, the Ananias wasn't exactly jumping up and down to go do it, was he? He knew of his reputation. He knew of his past. He knew what he had done to believers. And he wasn't quite ready to go into his presence. But God said, no, I am doing something. I have a purpose for him in his sinfulness. Believer, God has a purpose for you even though you are a sinner, even though you have messed up, even though you have a past. God has a purpose for you in his kingdom. You have something that you need to be doing. And if we allow our past to define us, we are robbing God of the ability to use us for his glory. Paul was the chief of sinners. He called himself that, the chief of sinners. He murdered and hated and persecuted Christians violently with rage. And not only did he do it, he incited others to do it, incited mobs to do it, and looked on it with approval. Yet in an instant, God blinded him, humbled him, and gave him a calling in the kingdom. Church, there's nothing you have done that disqualifies you from doing the work of ministry. Nothing. And he uses us to empower those who have messed up. Do you see this also? He uses other disciples to encourage those who have messed up. He sends Ananias to find him praying, to lay hands on him, to give him his sight back, to encourage him. Church, when believers come in from this world and are saved, we don't look at them with scorn. We don't look at them and look down on them, we look at them and see how can we empower them with the power of the Holy Spirit to do what God has called them to do. It's our responsibility. And that's what God did through Ananias in Saul's life. So we see that Ananias goes to Saul. Let's carry on. Oh, I almost forgot. Verse 16. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Something else we've got to know, Christians, that suffering is a part of serving. Suffering is a part of serving. Just because we come to Christ, just because we are redeemed and God gets a hold of us, doesn't mean we're immune to suffering. We will suffer the whole way through this journey called life. But through it, we know the power of God deeper. Through it, we learn to trust deeper. Through it, we know Him deeper. We cannot allow suffering to keep us from completing our mission. Are we truly members of the mission if we allow suffering to stop us? Christ suffered more than we can imagine. And it didn't stop him from pouring out his life's blood. Suffering is expected. But the reason we endure it is for the sake of his name. That whatever I go through, Lord, may I be faithful to you and point people to you and say there's a greater purpose in my suffering, and that is that others may know Jesus Christ for his name's sake. I'll go through whatever you call me to go through, Lord, so people will know you and know the power of your resurrection. And so now we get to the point where Ananias goes to Paul's house Verse 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. We tell you, this is, this is more than just a picture of the physical. This is a picture of the spiritual. Where Paul was blind, he had been lost, he had been a sinner, God got a hold of him, God saved him, the scales from his eyes fell away, and he gained his spiritual sight. I was blind, but now I see amazing grace entered his life, changed him, redeemed him, 
He was strengthened. And we see what he did next. We see what he did next. For some days he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews and lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When Paul received his calling, when Paul was redeemed and forgiven, he didn't sit around and do nothing. Church, he got up and immediately went to work. Can you imagine what he faced? The questions, the looks. You are the one who has killed our brothers, our sisters, and now you're doing this? But Paul continued. Paul continued, even though people looked at him and said it probably won't last. People probably looked at him and said, there's no way this is true. Paul continued, and he became one of the most influential Christians to walk this planet. He influenced, influences our lives today. Because he went from a murderer to a missionary. He went from a murderer to a missionary in the course of about three days when God got a hold of him. He immediately began to fulfill the purpose God had given him for his life. The core of the truth of this sermon comes from Psalm 103.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. When Paul was forgiven, they were, they were forgotten, y'all. His sins were forgotten, removed as far as the east is from the west. Church, believer, when you were forgiven, your sins were forgotten. And nothing in your past disqualifies you from fulfilling the call and the purpose that God has for you in your life. So if you're sitting here this morning in shame and guilt saying, I can't do it because you're not sitting here in the power of God. You're sitting here in the guilt and the shame of the enemy. My encouragement, my challenge for you this morning is to immediately rise up and go about the Paul and the purpose that you have on your life. There is nothing greater that we can do than be faithful right now. I heard a quote this week, understanding is not required, but obedience is. We don't have to understand that all God was doing. I'm sure Paul didn't understand everything that was going on in his life, but he was obedient. We don't have to understand, church. We have to be obedient. We have to be obedient to the cause of Christ. May God strengthen us in our weakness. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you, God.